Center for Irish Studies at the British University in Egypt, Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Uh, we're very happy this evening to have with us Professor Andrew Og, uh, who is a professor of English and director of the Irish Studies minor at Loras College, Iowa in the United States. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Professor Andrew. Thank you very much, Rania. I appreciate it. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to speak to uh, scholars across the world. Um, my own institution is a small Catholic institution. It's located about two and a half hours west of Chicago to give you a sense of it. Like Cairo, it's in a river city. The city is located of Dubuque, located on the banks of the Mississippi River. So I'm assuming that we all are aware of the acuteness of the climate crisis. The fact that uh, the last seven years have been the hottest on record since global temperatures have been recorded. The fact that um, 19 of the uh, last 20 years have been so. That carbon dioxide, which is the main um, agent of greenhouse gas to that retains heat within the atmosphere is at the highest level it's been in in um, 2.4 million years. So partly it was with a sense of the urgency of that, that this particular project was initiated. And it seems, I think, probably a little bit odd to take a very niche academic area of um, contemporary Irish poetry and to link it to what is perhaps the greatest challenge that humanity has uh, faced. But it seems to me that this is a situation where all academic disciplines need to focus on, um, find ways to focus on this crisis. And there are some ways in which uh, Ireland is, is in Irish poetry is a fit subject, a fit area for dealing with the climate crisis. Just to identify a couple of those, the um, peat bog, which is the most significant of the landforms in Ireland is a tremendous, um, what we would call carbon sink, it stores CO2. And the island, as an island, Ireland constitutes what uh, geologists refer to as an ecotone, and that is a place where um, uh, divergent uh, geological zones intersect. And these places are often places where issues associated with climate crisis are acute. And Irish poetry itself is, is founded, um, grounded in the a Christian Celtic tradition that regards nature in all of its forms as um, having a kind of spiritual presence. I'd, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about some of the other essays in um, this book before I launch into talking about my own. Um, it, it, let me start by referencing um, uh, two essays by American scholars, Donna Potts and Christine Cusack, both of whom write on the um, West coast of Ireland poet, Moya Cannon. Um, Cannon is a, a poet who's been around for a long time, but is increasingly being recognized for the work that she has done in um, ecological areas. In Donna Potts's piece, she focuses on the way in which um, the uh, Cannon's poetry evokes the sounds of the landscape and creates a kind of resonance. It, she works out of a field very interesting new field called ecomusicology. And so the way in which those resonances from the um, landscape draw uh, humans into this kind of shared experience of uh, enrichment and loss. And, and she posits the possibility of the way in which music can be a community making activity that it could do so uh, actually across species. Um, Christine Cusack's piece does something similar. She also shows how Cannon's poetry blurs the boundaries between the non-human and the human by showing how um, her she correlates human writing with animal tracks and other natural um, inscriptions. So she she posits that there are these um, her revelations of these linguistic linkages acknowledge the collaborative world making that uh, um, occurs between um, humans and, and nature. Lucy Collins, an Irish scholar, addresses how the experimental Irish poet, um, Maurice Scully is guided, his poetry is guided and developed by imitating the forms and actions of plants. So 
her um, analysis uh, points out the way in which Scully's poetry gives us a heightened awareness of the potency of plants, um, expands our knowledge of their powers of intelligence and communication. And then uh, I, I think a very interesting chapter by the Irish language um, scholar and poet, um, Olna Nagarva, looks at how several contemporary Irish language poets explore the connection between the loss of the Irish language and the loss of crucial habitat that shelters the distinctive flora and fauna of the Gwaltak, that's the, the Irish speaking areas on the south and west of the country. And she shows that when the indigenous language is lost, the traditional knowledge that it carries about this habitat disappears as well. So the extinction of the language um, uh, often accelerates the extinction of the um, creatures that inhabit those kind of marginalized areas. So what these essays and my own essay share is a theoretical um, link to what has been called the non-human turn. Um, minimize this just so that everybody can see. So the non-human turn really, uh, it, it's got a number of uh, people who have um, worked in this area. I'm using the work primarily of um, the political theorist, Jane Bennett. And essentially what it argues is that that familiar schema that we use that divides the world into active human subjects and passive non-human objects needs to be discarded because the reality is that human and non-human entities are so deeply intertwined that whatever ensues from their interactions has to be seen from coming from multiple agencies. So from this perspective, nature you know, needs to be regarded not as an inert thing, but as a, a co-actor. Um, the non-human turn seeks to retrieve the perspective of traditional indigenous cultures in which rocks, trees, rivers are regarded as manifesting spiritual presence. It's a kind of personhood worthy of respect and care. Um, this act of retrieval doesn't seek to restore the old mythologies of these cultures, but rather it seeks to awaken us, as, as Bennett puts it, to the liveliness hidden in other than human things and the threads of connections binding their fates to ours. So I'm going to turn now to talking about my particular um, essay in this. The impetus for this came from partly my own extensive reading and, and writing about um, Seamusini, but in particular, it was an awareness of the um, importance, the ecological importance of bogs. And knowing that, and knowing the centrality of bogs in Heaney's own poetry, I wondered if there could be a way of linking those two things. So I'll talk a little bit now about bogs. Here's a picture of Seamus. Um, around a bunch of peat, the, the, the kind of um, soft coal, if you will, that is formed in peat bogs. So just a couple of things that when I became aware of it, I was quite struck by it. So peat bogs cover um, about 3% of the world's, of the Earth's uh, land surface. Most of them are in the Northern Hemisphere. But I, I would say that there are significant peat bogs in, um, uh, Africa, in the Congo in particular. In fact, just recently, the New York Times had a piece about the significance of the um, peat bogs in the, with regards to climate change that are in the Congo. Uh, the, the really crucial point here is that bogs store 450 billion metric tons of carbon. That's more than all the world's trees. So they're an enormously effective um, uh, uh, landscape in terms of containing um, carbon and not releasing it into the atmosphere and then thereby um, mitigating uh, its uh, impact on um, global warming. Now, when, um, and hopefully you can see this, uh, whoops, sorry, jump ahead. Here's an image of the peat bog. So just a, a brief description, bogs are this um, highly waterlogged, oxygen depleted, acidic kind of environment. And the nature of the bog is that 
organic material enters it and is deposited in it um, at, at a higher level then it decays. So what that means is that organic material builds up, it compresses, and it forms peat, which is, as I said, kind of a soft version of um, coal. And that just reveals the extent to which Ireland is dominated by bogs. It has the highest percentage of bog land per capita, um, uh, I'm sorry, per air area of uh, any country other than, than Finland. Now, the challenge here is that um, Seamus Heaney, who wrote these bog poems primarily in the 1970s, wasn't aware of, of climate crisis. He wasn't aware of the, the central um, ecological role of the bog. He was focused on their cultural significance, right? The way in which they contained artifacts, ancient artifacts, um, skeletons of extinct animals, and, and perhaps most notably, the bodies of sacrificial victims from 2000 years ago. That's what struck Heaney's attention. I think, however, and this was, uh, I think, a, a crucial point for me, the awareness um, conveyed by the American um, literary scholar, Jay Hillis Miller, that in this situation, the climate crisis, we need to read things uh, anachronistically, if you will. We need to take them out of their original context and put them in the context of the climate crisis. So that's what I've attempted to do in, um, in this chapter, this essay that I've written. In doing that, I, I want to um, shift away from what Heaney talks about. Heaney says that his poems emphasize the bog as a locus of preservation. In other words, it, it's a kind of natural museum where all these things from the past are preserved. The acidic and anaerobic um, nature of the bog means that things that go into it don't decay in the way that uh, they would if they were exposed to the atmosphere. I, I, I'm looking to read these poems in a way that focuses on the potency of the bog itself and the way that it, that imprints itself on these poems. And in doing so, um, makes these shows how these poems emphasize that the bog's not just a place where other things are preserved, but that it needs to be a focus of preservation in some right. So to bring out that um, kind of occluded, that aspect of, of these poems, one of the things that I made use of was, again, this uh, theoretical work that comes out of um, the non-human turn, also comes out of a, a, a movement known as vital materialism, and in particular, the work, again, of this political theorist, um, Jane Bennett. Jane Bennett talks about non-human things as having power. Um, she makes reference to that as thing power. And she talks about it as showing up in two forms. One is the way in which these things are recalcitrant, the way in which they refuse to give themselves over to our own efforts to kind of control and categorize and conceptualize them. And she suggests that that, that recalcitrance gives them a kind of capacity for both to both trigger both delight and disturbance. <clears throat> the second thing that she emphasizes in terms of thing power is the, the kind of anthropomorphizing awareness. In other words, that we see in these things, a kind of agency, a kind of creative um, potency that connects to us in some way. And that, that establishes a sense of kinship, of uh, sympathetic attunement to them. So these two elements of, um, of uh, uh, thing power are the, the, the guiding principles that I used in my readings of um, Heaney's poetry. So what I wanna do next is I'm gonna talk about several Heaney poems and talk about how I read them through this particular lens. So we'll turn to the poems themselves. The first of these is arguably the um, 
you know, most famous or the most bog-centered of uh, Heaney's poems. It's a poem called Bogland, written from a book called Wintering Out. You can see the poem on the screen, but I'll read it um, as well before I start talking about it. We have no prairies to slice a big sun at evening. Everywhere the eye concedes to encroaching horizon is wooed into the cyclops eye of a tarn that's like a little glacial lake. Our unfenced country is bog that keeps cresting between the sights of the sun. They've taken the skeleton of the great Irish elk out of peat and set it up an astounding crate full of air. Butter sunk under more than a hundred years was recovered salty and white. The ground itself is kind, black butter. Melting and opening underfoot, missing its last definition by millions of years, they'll never dig coal here. Only the waterlogged trunks of great firs soft as pulp. Our pioneers kept striking inwards and downwards. Every strip, every layer they strip seems camped on before. The bog holes might be Atlantic seepage. The wet center is bottomless. So what we first notice is how um, Haiti approaches the, the bog and it's familiar guys as a, a kind of archive where these natural objects, the, the great Irish elk, um, human artifacts, butter are preserved. But what I think gives the poem its um, status as being his ultimate bog poem is the way he positions the bog as defining both the physical and the psychic landscape of Ireland. Um, he, he makes use of this very deft exercise in um, comparative uh, cultural geography by contrasting the bog with the American prairies that, you know, covered the American uh, West. And there's a juxtaposition of these two landscapes and how they influence people. The, the pioneers that cross these uh, prairies, these oceans of tall grass in 19th century America, did so with the idea that they were jettisoning, jettisoning the past and we're, we're going to attain a new, more prosperous identity. In contrast, the Irish have no open vistas beckoning them onward with, to a future rife with possibilities. This encroaching horizon, their claustrophobic bog-ridden terrain draws them like a magnet, magnet inwards and downwards in a, in a futile quest for a lost cultural identity. What's obvious here, but seldom noted, is the way in which the poem presents the physical landscape as shaping human action. This reverses what has been called the, the scopic regime inaugurated by Western painting in which the human observer acquires the status of subject by looking on an objectified natural scene. Bogland overturns that hierarchical um, framework it eleva that elevates the human subject over non-human environments. Instead, Bogland confirms the environmental anthropologist Tim Ingold's observation that humans and the landscapes they inhabit are mutually constituted, that the landscapes take on meaning and appearance, this is a quote from Ingold, in relation to people, and people develop skills and knowledge and identities in relationship to the landscapes in which they find themselves. What distinguishes the bog landscape, bogland landscape in um, Heaney's poem is its enigmatic presence. The bog, um, he casts the bog as amorphous and um, unfathomable, missing its last definition by millions of years, its wet center being bottomless. So in its focus on the bog's elusiveness, the poem evokes the power of things to withdraw themselves from human apprehension, to evade our uh, efforts to categorize or conceptualize them. And as I've indicated previously, the theorist Jane Bennett asserts that this kind of recalcitrance endows things with their own very distinctive, quote, non-human vitality. So this resistance of this landscape to our own efforts to conceptually apprehend it can have a very salutary ecological effect, compelling us to adopt a posture of respect rather than dominance towards it. 
And this is evident in the, the tone of wonder that Heaney strikes when he acknowledges the bog's incomprehensibility. So that's, I think, the main reading way I would read this poem. There is a, another dimension to it that requires, I think, a little bit more reaching, but that I think is important. And I'm going to turn to that um, now. So Bennett notes that this withdrawal of things from our conceptual grasp, it, it can, as I indicated, provoke a kind of um, respect. But she indicates it can also trigger a kind of resentment. And to, as she notes, quote, when the thing thwarts our desire for conceptual and practical mastery, this refusal angers us. And it's at that point that the deference um, before the mystery of these non-human things kind of dissipates into a benighted recklessness. So I, I, I want to um, probe that idea a little bit. Um, and it, it seems to me that this is a particular thing to which um, colonial powers are uh, um, susceptible to, that their lack of understanding, that the remoteness, the strangeness of the landscapes that they occupy often triggers a kind of attitude of resentment towards those landscapes. And he makes this brief reference at the beginning to what ha to the um, pioneers that settled the Great Plains in um, late 19th century America. And this is a perfect example of that way in which unfamiliar unfamiliarity with the landscape leads to a very destructive approach to it. So these pioneers were unaware of the dryness of the climate, the thinness of the topsoil. They were uninterested in the practices of sustainability cultivated by the region's indigenous inhabitants. So they plowed over the native grass um, and planted fields of uh, maize and wheat in pursuit of profit. The consequence of their heedlessness became apparent a few decades later when that fertile ground that had for millennia generated grasslands capable of feeding millions of bison suddenly disintegrated in the dust. So this example of the American Dust Bowl illustrates the colonizers, how the colonizers' hostile ignorance of unfamiliar indigenous environments eventuates in their destructive exploitation. Now, it would seem like this environmental degradation wrought upon the American prairies by colonialism has little reference to bog land, which alludes to that um, landscape only briefly, and which as a poem seems to focus not so much on colonization, but on an essential aspect of decolonization, that, that quest to retrieve a personal, uh, I'm sorry, a pre-colonial identity that's buried in the depths of the past. What struck me though, is that there is this very aggressive under, undercurrent to the way the poem describes that search. That line at the end of the penultimate stanza, our pioneers kept striking inwards and downwards. And I started thinking about that line and I started thinking about the aggression that's implied in it and thinking, what if we see this line, if we see this poem, perhaps from not so much from a national perspective, but from a global perspective. And I would say that one of the charges that we have when we are doing literary analysis in the Anthropocene in this age where humans are transforming the, uh, the planet is to read things in that global context. So I, I started thinking of that line and I started thinking of it in terms of the, um, again, colonial uh, environmental exploitation. And, and in, in particular, we, we know that colonialism do, didn't end when there were no longer new worlds on the horizon. It, it simply shifted its focus downward. When colonial conquest, while colonial conquest has always exploited the resources below the ground as well as those above, that focus has now become rapaciously single-minded. The new colonization of the underground spans the globe, from the river deltas in um, Nigeria to the tar sands in Alberta, Canada, the extraction of energy resources, oil, natural gas, coal from the earth has despoiled both this subterranean realm and the corresponding uh, territories on the surface. In this context, the act that concludes the poem's penultimate uh, stanza, this incessant probing downward into the bog's interior, 
calls to mind not so much this kind of symbolic um, uh, mining of the psychic and cultural depths for shards of lost identity, but rather the ruthless extra extirpation of fossil matter such as peat and coal from the earth. In the poem's culminating assertion that the wet center is bottomless appears less as a, um, uh, a kind of respectful acknowledgement of the bog's unfathomability than a heedless assumption that its reserve of peat is inexhaustible. And it, it's been that attitude, that unwillingness to look at the bog's finite limits that has led um, successive Irish governments to fail in terms of preserving and protecting the bog lands adequately. I, I'm going to turn here to um, another of Heaney's poems, one that focuses on what um, are famously referred to as the bog bodies. And in doing that, again, I will be making use of the ideas of Jane Bennett, in particular, the way in which things by evoking a kind of anthropomorphic connection um, are able to reveal their own, um, their own creative agency and, and potency. So these poems that are, um, these bog body poems as they're called, these are things that Heaney wrote in response to reading P. V. Globe, a, a, a Danish archaeologist um, book called The Bog People, in which there were some very stunning photographs of bodies that had been um, recovered from bogs in northern Denmark uh, after 2,000 years of, of internment there. He was fascinated by the images, but he was also fascinated by this kind of connection that he saw between these sacrificial victims, because um, Globe asserts that most of these people were the bodies that were exhumed were victims to a, a kind of mother goddess figure. Um, Heaney makes a link between that and the violence that happened in the north of Ireland between Protestants and Catholics. And he, went, he, he sees a kind of parallel between the sacrifices of those two things. And that's been the main way in which these poems have been read and, and, and criticized and explored. And it's, I think, had the effect of pushing the bog itself into the background and, and reducing it essentially to um, nothing more than a, a kind of sarcophagus containing a, a mummified body. Um, I would suggest that the poems are much richer and that when we look at them from an eco-critical perspective, we, we see things in a different way. So I'm gonna turn to, this is the Grabu man, um, one of the uh, bog bodies that he talk is, uh, that Heaney focuses on. And I'm gonna read the poem again and then talk about it in this um, eco-critical perspective. As if he had been poured in tar, he lies on a pillow of turf and seems to weep the black river of himself. The grains of his wrist is like bog oak, the ball of his heel like a basalt egg. His instep has shrunk cold as a swan's foot or a wet swamp root. His hips are the ridge and purse of a muscle, his spine and eel arrested under the glisten of mud. The head lifts, the chin is a visor raised above the vent of his slashed throat that has tanned and toughened. The cured wound opens to a dark um, elderberry place. Who would say corpse to his visit cast? Who would say body to his opaque repose? In his rusted hair, a mat unlikely as a fetus. I first saw his twisted face in a photograph a head and shoulder out of the peat, bruised like a forceps baby. This is a very, very rich poem, it has lots of dimensions to it. But as I said, I have this particular focus that I want to uh, work through a little bit. So I think the thing that's striking is that this opening description of the Grabo man, where we get this kind of dark blaze on this, this 
anat- uh, uh, um, itemizing of his body. It becomes an inventory of the wetland environment itself, of bog water, petrified wood, egg-shaped stone, a root of Russia reed, a fossilized mussel or eel. So the, the catalog really emphasizes the bogs merger with the organic, I'm sorry, the bodies merger with the organic and mineral matter of the bog. Um, and the poem amplifies this congruity between um, body and bog by casting the grabule man as the bog's offspring. That, that phrase, his rusted hair, a mat unlikely as a fetus's, his forehead bruised like a forcep baby. The poem presents this figuratively, but I, I want to suggest that it's literally true. The Grabu man in its suspended state of liquefaction has been generated by the bog. It's the product of the bog in the same way that a statue is produced by its sculpture. The transformation of the Grabu man's body into this kind of ebony effigy, this, this entity of mesmerizing, discomforting liminality, testifies to the creative potency and the agency of the bog. It blurs, as Heaney put it in a later lecture, um, the uh, boundary that separates culture from nature. So here we see that second dimension of thing power and, and a way in which this poem reveals the power of the bog, the potency of the bog, the bog's agency in the production of, of the body. Um, as we know it now. So there's a subsequent um, uh, poem that I'm gonna look at. Uh, and then after that, I think we'll have time for um, questions or chat if you, you wish to do that. The second poem is um, called The Bog Queen. And in, in this poem, that uh, boundary between culture and nature gets erased completely. So the poem, just to provide a little bit of context here, focuses on the first bog body discovered in Ireland. And this body was unearthed from its peaty grave on the estate of these uh, Anglo-Irish colonizers, Lord and Lady Mora. And this happened in the late 18th century in Northern Ireland. So if Egypt and other places in Africa were among uh, Great Britain's last colonies, Ireland was its first. And this evocation that we get later of the peer's wife who um, kind of violates this, this grave uh, evokes that, that colonial context. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. This, um, the Bog Queen is, is not like the Grabu Man, a sacrificial victim. Uh, archaeologists have suggested that this is a highborn Viking lady from the 19th century whose who's very um, well accoutred grave was, was probably overtaken by the bog. In this poem, as in the previous one, the bog body is identified as an outgrowth or extension of the bog. We get that in, again, the penultimate stanza where there is this reference to what the plate of her hair being like a slimy birth cord of the bog. Here, the bog's um, assimilation of the body is so absolute. I mean, we see it throughout that first part of the poem where we see what, um, my body was braille for the creeping influences. Dawn suns groped over my head, cooled my feet through the, my fabrics and skins. The seeps of winter digested me, the illiterate roots pondered and died in the cavings of my stomach and socket. I lay waiting on the gravel um, bottom, my dark brain, my brain darkening, a jar of spawn fermenting underground. She's actually, the body here is overtaken by the block. And, you know, we have the bog queen in, in a sense, because the poem is through her voice, ventriloquizing the bog. So the significance of this, of her linkage with the bog itself, I think shows up in the references to the way in which the bog is plundered by um, Lady Mora, right? The peer's wife who, you know, has the body uh, um, taken out of the bog. This calls to mind, um, again, this issue of 
colonialism's devastating impact, not just on Irish boglands, but on the global environment uh, as a whole. Um, so bogs were formed in Ireland as a result of the, the kind of wetter climatological conditions that followed the last ice age. But this process was accelerated um, by a kind of deforestation that happened in the Bronze Age. Um, so they were partly created, bogs were partly created by a clearance of woodlands in Ireland. But the later, more comprehensive deforestation of Ireland that happened in the 16th century when the Tudors invaded Ireland set in motion the destruction of the bogs. And what happened is that these, the large tracts of forest that had existed in Ireland well into the 17th century were cut down by British colonists who cleared the woodlands to make room for plantations to make a profit from the lumber. And as a consequence, the indigenous Irish were forced to rely much more heavily on the peat extracted from bogs for fuel. And that, that scene I showed at the beginning of Heening sitting around the peat that had been extracted from the bog, that would be gone. That would be then dried out and, and used to, to heat and, and cook. And this intensification of um, removal of peat resulted in the extraction of 5 million tons of peat each year during the peak period of, the, um, of uh, use of peat as fuel in the 18th and 19th century. It's important to note that if the British had had their way, this loss of peat would have the destruction, the removal of the bogs would have been much more intensive. Um, there were plans made by a commission on bogs to drain the bog lands and then use the reclaimed land to produce flax, a, a, a component uh, that would um, help produce sail, sails that would be required for the expanding British fleet that was um, attempting to, to um, fend off the threat posed by um, Napoleon. That scheme got abandoned as impractical, but it, it didn't stop the efforts, the colonial efforts to eradicate what was perceived as a, a kind of wasteland. Between um, 1823 and 1875, 18 different bills were um, presented to the um, Irish government, the Irish parliament, to that proposed drain, I mean, it was actually the British parliament, sorry, to propose draining the box. Um, and, and I think it's worth noting that the, this kind of large scale destruction of the Irish boglands, which was inaugurated by the British um, colonization of Ireland in the 16th century, kind of forecasts the more drastic ecological transformation occasioned by European colonial expansion into the Americas. This intrusion of the old world into the new generated such enormous transfers of fauna, flora, microbiotic organisms that according to the geologists, Simon Lewis and Gary Maslin, it produced a quote, swift ongoing radical reorganization of life on earth without geological precedent. For that reason, um, Lewis and Maslin proposed 1610, the date when the British colonial settlement of Jamestown in North of, uh, America was established as marking the onset of the Anthropocene. So in this link in this poem between colonialism and environmental destruction, another issue is evoked. And, and this is the, uh, the last, and I think a very interesting theoretical point that I wanna bring out and then apply to um, the Bog Queen poem. And it's associated with the notion of sovereignty. Um, sovereignty is a, a, a complex vex term. At its most basic level, it, it refers to who or what has authority and power over a particular territory like the notion of agency, we're used to thinking of sovereignty in exclusively human terms, to see it as residing in institutions such as monarchies, nation states, provincial, local governments. However, the French philosopher Bruno Latour, in his very brilliant book, Facing Gaia, 
has argued for an extended notion of sovereignty. He's argued that if we're going to survive the climate crisis, we must expand our notion of sovereignty to include um, not just humans, but to include bioregions and natural elements. In, in other words, he's suggesting yes. that the interest of these non-human entities have to be taken into consideration in any political process that would uh, affect them. This seems a far-fetched idea, but he cites, Latour cites a real world example to illustrate this. He points out how in the Netherlands, there are deputies on the National Water Authority who are representing the interests of the river and sea. This is a, a very powerful group agency. It directs the country's commercial and public use of, of, uh, of uh, water. And there are deputies there who are there to represent sovereignty, the, the rights of um, the ocean and rivers. So in traditional societies um, without state institutions, sovereignty was often sanctioned by a goddess figure. To enforce his um, extended notion of sovereignty, Latour conjures up the planetary, um, planetary sovereignty goddess um, Gaia, the ancient Greek earth deity. Now, Latour's Gaia is not the benign figure of popular imagination, at least in, in America, where Gaia is seen as symbolizing the planet as a, a single organism. Latour's Gaia is instead a terrifying force that encapsulates the Earth's myriad reactions to the destructive human activities um, uh, associated with the climate crisis. Latour's Gaia represents the Earth's capacity to fight back against human efforts at domination. The proliferating fire, forest fires, droughts, windstorms, and other means, Gaia reminds humans that their claims to absolute planetary sovereignty are no longer viable and that we must share power with the natural world. So now back briefly to the Bog Queen and back to this. So in the Bog Queen and elsewhere in, in these Bog poems, Heaney evokes the notion of sovereignty. He does it in a very localized way and in, in a colonial context where sovereignty, there's an association of these figures with um, the Mother Ireland figure, a, a kind of national uh, um, uh, sovereignty uh, goddess who represents the, the stolen sovereignty uh, of a nation that has been overtaken and ransacked by colonial invaders. The poem Bog Queen has been read as a modern version of the traditional Irish genre of the Aislinn, where a Mother okay. Ireland figure is, quote, from the quote from the Irish philosopher Richard Kearney, uh, the Mother Ireland figure is redeemed from colonial violation and restored to her pristine sovereignty. But that's not the case of, with what happens at the end of the Heaney poem. The revivified um, bog queen who rises out of the, her grave, dark hacked bones, skull wear, frayed stitches, tufts, small gleams of the fang, it is not restored to her previous integrity. Instead, she appears as a, a patchwork of loosely quilted parts, hacked bones, skull wear, frayed stitches. Um, the Heaney critic Henry Hart has argued that in this kind of grotesque figure, we see all the, quote, shabby and menacing gloom of Frankenstein's monster. However, I want to suggest that we should see something else. When we look at this poem from an eco-critical perspective, we're, we should see in the Bog Queen traces of something more ominous, more portentous. The fractured spectre of the Bog Queen arises, like Latour's Gaia, to defend her territory from further desecration. In the guise of Gaia, the Earth's ominous agency, its, its power to enact countermeasures against anthropogenic destruction, is con consolidated in a form that demands our attention. As the Bog Queen arises from her peaty grave at the poem's end, she becomes an avatar of Gaia. 
a monetary presence, th uh, a monetary presence threatening retribution for human intrusions into our domain, warning us that if we fail to respect the territories that we inhabit, they will begin to terrorize us. So that's the presentation. Let me pop off here and be able to see you all. Um, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you, you might have, any thoughts that you might have uh, uh, about this uh, effort to, um, to produce a, 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 an eco-critical reading, if you will, of these bot poems. Um, hi, I'm I'm happy to comment. Um, Absolutely. I, my name is Fnola, my name is Fnola Colgan. I'm I, right in the heart of the bogland in, in Ireland, and we have an expression: if somebody is kind of um, maybe not very mannerly or not very well dressed, or what do you expect? You came from a bog. Sure. So it's just an Irish expression. Yeah. No, I I, I found it very interesting um, because there is a big. I, I'm not sure whether you'll have been following it or not or picked up on it but there's been a big kind of political controversy about uh, the Green Party put in a policy that people cannot take and and um, harvest their bugs and um, so the government has had to back down because it's so much power to people's lives and their homelands and and they try to back back to it from the point of view of um, um, that yes they could they could save it for their own use but not for for selling or giving to neighbors or whatever, say. So I, I think they've had to back back on it because it's such a part of cultural Ireland. And but I know it's also about maybe preserving. But I suppose for me, one of the things when you were going through um, the poems was um, I was I had reason and rightly honored to be in Cairo there a few weeks ago and got to the museum. And I couldn't but think of, you know, I can't pronounce the names of the people, but there's two preserved bodies there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just kind of incredible, say, all those hundreds of years later that that Heaney has been writing as he has, and and you know, and how he so he pretty well massacred the body and how it was massacred with the bog cutting. So really, really interesting, very imagery and very visionary poetry. Thanks for um, um, Finola for mentioning that. Um controversy over uh, um, protection of the bogs. And yes, I mean, you know, extraction of peat, the cutting of turf has been a, a, a central part of Irish culture for many, many years. Um, I noticed uh, recently in the Irish Times, Fitton O'Toole had a um, editorial in which he essentially was critiquing um, city dwellers, sub suburbanite people for what he saw as a kind of hypocrisy and they're still yeah. driving their cars and emitting CO2. I, I, I didn't fully agree with it. I'm, I'm an outsider, I guess, because it's not just, you know, that you're, um, uh, you know, producing CO2, uh, CO2 greenhouse gases by driving, but the bogs as this carbon sink, when you release it, it really has a, a, a you know, traumatic impact. But uh, I'll leave you to, uh, to settle that. We have more than enough problems of our own here in the States in terms of dealing okay. with uh, climate crisis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, it was just so interesting and to have done all the research you've done and to identify those poems in particular. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Fanola. I think we have a couple yeah. of questions in, uh, in the attendees and the audiences. Um, so before I take the ones in the chat box, if anyone would like to ask, and then I'll take the questions posted in the chat box. Yes, uh, Professor Ahlem Osman, please go ahead. Hello, thank you, Dr. Rania. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed the talk um, and I can relate. Uh, Professor Ahlem, to... can you please introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Clem Osman, Associate Professor of English Literature. Uh, I'm interested in uh, poetry um, uh, these days because I'm working on my second PhD in comparing uh, uh, Isra Pound's uh, Cantus and uh, Ali Abdel Hadi's The Cantu or In Nashida. Uh, from a comparative poetics perspective. I, um, 
I can relate to uh, uh, Irish poetry. I, I published uh, a paper uh, a few years ago uh, comparing uh, Shemus Heaney and Abdel Mati Hgazi, uh, one of the uh, leading poets uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, who received uh, Ahmed Shawki uh, Award in 2019, and he is uh, known worldwide. Um, I compared their use of space, especially gendered space. So I can see the importance of space uh, for Irish poets, as well as Egyptian ones, especially who live in the countryside, who come from the countryside, like Abdel Mati Gezi. I can also see or relate uh, post-colonialism to uh, Irish poetry, the idea of the bogland as a preserver of heritage of Irish identity and uh, history and tradition, the great Irish elk and the cyclops and so on and so forth. But I can't really see the link between climate crisis or the climate change <laughs> and the uh, and Seamus Heaney's Boglands. Um, I feel it's a bit imposed. Uh, would you clarify the link to me, please? Sure. Um, Thank you. First off, you're, you're very brave uh, to be working on uh, Pound's Cantos. Um, I, I certainly... Uh, recognize that this is a secondary and occluded part of these poems. I, I almost think about it in terms of the great Palestinian American critic Edward Said's notion of contrapuntal um, analysis where this aspect of a poem that's maybe been marginalized or neglected, you try and bring that to, or of a literary work, uh, bring that to the fore. So I'm very much reading these poems against the grain. Uh, Heaney did not in, intend you know, a poem like Bogland to be read as an environmental poem. Um, I think increasingly, and again, you know, the, there's some uh, scholars of, of more significance than myself, Jay Hillis Miller being the most evident who, who are calling for these kind of readings. So, in what I attempted to do is to show how in these indirect ways, um, uh, Heaney's poem acknowledges the power of the bog in and of itself. It, it's its own intrinsic presence, not just using it as, as a kind of what um, archive for these cultural things. And in the case of the poem Bogland, it, it's the way in which he evokes the sense of the bog's unfathomability, the way in which it, it just resists um, human efforts to kind of conceptualize it and, and grasp it. But, but I completely uh, understand why the readings may seem forced, to use the word that you used. Um, I, I don't think that they're imposed on the poems in the sense that they're, you know, arbitrary. I mean, I tried to, you know, work directly with the poems and find elements in them that, that you know, gave rise to this um, kind of analysis, but it, it certainly isn't the, the central aspect of the poems. It's a more marginal aspect. Usually when I read a poem, I uh, use the hermeneutic uh, uh, way of interpretation. So I go from the whole to the parts and from the parts to the whole again. And if the parts validate my interpretation, my first impression as a whole, uh, from the whole poem, then uh, it's a valid interpretation. So, would you, what, 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 what would you cite uh, to validate the interpretation of these poems as um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, climate uh, change? Well, I, I mean, I think the, the the primary thing is I'm I'm arguing that there is an ego critical dimension to them. Um, in a, and through that, they would evoke notions of of uh, um, of climate change. So. Um, and, and I know that, you know, in a talk, the things don't always get registered. But what I tried to do is show how the poems, without Heaney intending it, um, and, and I think, you know, poetry, other literary works always exceed what the author's uh, in, intentions were to evoke the kind of power of the bog in and of itself. So that's where I use the ideas from... Um, from uh, what's been called vital materialism, Jane Bennett, the, the way in which 
things illustrate their power both by their resistance to our um, ability to grasp them and by their evocation of this kind of anthropomorphic ability to, um, you know, to, to show their own agency and, and creative potency. And, and to me, for instance, a poem like Gravel Man, I don't want to, you know, continue to go back over um, what I said, is very clearly a poem that is evoking the power of the bog. It, it, it creates this figure that's, that's almost, uh, you know, like a sculpture and it's in the, in the way in which it triggers a kind of fascination that's created by the Bach. Um, so uh, that's what, uh, that's what I'm attempting to do. And, and I mean, as is always the case, uh, one can find a particular reading convincing or not convincing. Um, I, I would say that I took very, very seriously Hillis Miller's argument that um, we need to uh, apply a kind of Anthropocene um, uh, hermeneutic, and that is to read poems from a, a, an ecological perspective, even when they're not considered that. He does that. He uses Wallace Stevens' very famous poem, Man on a Dump, which is obviously about poetry and about the process of creating poetry. And Hillis Miller reads it as literally about the way we are trashing the planet. And he takes that, the, the, what is intended as a symbolic idea as, as a literal one. Thank you for those questions. They're very good. Thank you. Okay, I've got some questions in the chat box, Professor Andrew, if you don't mind. Sure. All right, uh, Professor Osama Medani, he's the Dean of the Faculty of Arts uh, in Monofe University, which, governed, which is a governorate in, in Egypt, but he had to um, excuse himself a few minutes ago, and his question is, critiquing poetry from an eco-critical, or this is a comment, and then he's got another question, critiquing, critiquing poetry from an eco-critical dimension, from a post-colonial Dimension seems self-contradictory for someone like me from Egypt. Eco-criticism is elitist for third world inhabitants. It's a Western perspective, while post-colonial criticism is the domain of the subaltern. Do you have any commentary on that one? Another um, great question uh, or point. I, I would... I would politely disagree that eco-criticism is the um, domain of, of, of first world elites. And I would disagree with it for this reason. It, the climate crisis affects all of us. And the fact of the matter is it affects people in, people that are more marginalized, people that are not first world, much more directly than it, than it affects someone who lives the, the cushioned life that uh, I would live in, in middle America. I mean, you know, we look at what temperatures are in currently in India and Pakistan, where they are, you know, in Fahrenheit 120. I mean, th these are unsustainable. And even in the States, it's, it's poor people who are living in flood zones, who are living often in areas that are um, the most vulnerable to the, the kinds of things that happen with, um, that happen with uh, climate change. And, and as for you know, post-colonialism, it, it certainly is something that um, subaltern critics, somebody like uh, Edward Said have taken the lead in but, but I've never felt that we should constrain ourselves either by positions of class or gender. I've, I've done feminist criticism and I, I can understand where that would, people would you know, perhaps be put off by that. But I think it's very important for a white first world male like myself to engage in seeing things from a post-colonial perspective, so. Well, thank you for that. Now, his second question, again, Professor Osama Medani says in the chat box, those living on the margin, where do the Bach poems fit in this critique? 
are they the products uh, of a poet who is an elitist European or of a citizen of colonized nation? Well, Heaney is both of those things, right? Um, you know, he both was a colonized subject. I mean, the uh, Irish Catholics in the North had their own, um, what, discrimination against them. Certainly not as severe as the discrimination directed towards Black people in America during the Jim Crow era, and that's still lingering on, but a significant enough discrimination. So he does see things from very much an, an anti or, um, if you will, post-colonial perspective. Um, I'm not, I, and, and, you know, again, I'm my own ignorance of um, Mideastern poetry, uh, and I would be happy to be educated more in that. I understand how uh, references to a landscape that is not, you know, one that is uh, pertinent to Egypt, it seems a little strange. Um, it is pertinent to the world, pertinent to Africa. Again, as I, I suggested earlier, the New York Times had an extensive um, series of articles about uh, the peat bogs in the Congo and, and their, you know, role in, in um, mitigating the climate um, crisis. So uh, I, this, to me, if there's value in the talk, it's not just perhaps, uh, you know, a new interpretation of uh, Heaney poems that may or may not be convincing, but a different way of reading, a way of reading that calls upon us to, um, just like Saeed, you know, wanted that counterpunctual reading to find the traces of imperialism in um, Western works, even Western works that had attempted to occlude it, like Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, um, that, that we, you know, need to do that with as many texts as we can. And thank you for that. Now, Professor Medini also says, the presentation seems to stand midway that reconciles both perspective. Is this possible, viable in a world in which people mostly take firm cultural oppositional standpoints? So it, I'm assuming that that is casting it or, or talking about um, the position, whether it's a, this is a poet who is a, part of a first world elite or a poet who is representing a, um, a colonized culture. And, and I would say that, well, I wasn't primarily focused on, um, on Heaney relation, his relation to uh, British colonialism. Um, colonialism does come up, but, but that um, question about Heaney's status in that regard is a frequent question that's asked about him. He, 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 you know, he, he is both of those things. I mean, this is a, a poet who was feted throughout the whole world, who won the Nobel Prize, a, 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 um, a, 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 a um, poet who um, taught at the great, greatest universities in, in America and in England. So I can completely understand that. He did grow up under circumstances though, where he was overtly discriminated against. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Dr. Nora, I think you have a, you've posted a comment. Can you please go ahead and read it? Um, you know, share it with us directly. Uh, good evening, Professor. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rania. Uh, you introduce yourself first, please. <laughs> Well, um, my name is Nora and I'm a TA at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities uh, at the British University. Uh, thank you for, so much. I really enjoyed uh, this. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. You have no idea. I really liked it a lot. And uh, specifically, I like the idea of uh, Latour's Gaia with the Bob Queen. I think that was like, uh, at the end, that, that was really, really very clear that you're able to relate the uh, the idea of climate change and the issues of uh, climate change to eco-criticism. But that, that brings me to that question, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor, do you think that, uh, because that's why I really felt that you, critiquing poems, uh, especially poems that were written uh, like uh, the Bogland in the, in the 50s or mid uh, 20th century, should we like relate those? I mean, um, if you have to view them from the eco critic point of view, uh, we must also uh, put 
post-colonial reading uh, or critiquing poems into our consideration. I mean, they should go together or overlap together. Thank you. Thank you for your, your comments, uh, uh, Professor Khalil. Um, I, yeah, no, I don't think that, uh, I, I think that they're, they very much overlap. And uh, to me, I, I tried to make that overlap in the poem, The Bog Queen, where we, we get a reference to um, the colonial um, dimension and the colonial interference, if, to put it um, simply, in the native and indigenous environment. Um, so they're, they're very much of a piece. Um, I did uh, a paper or a chapter for a book a few years back that dealt with a uh, Native American novelist, Leslie Marmon Silco. Um, she's Pueblo. Uh, and has a, a tremendous book called Ceremony. And there, and I made an attempt to uh, read it also in light of uh, climate change. And in th there, you know, the colonial dimension is just overwhelming. I mean, they, these are people who have been subjected to a kind of environmental degradation um, for centuries. Um, so yes, I, I do think that there is a direct connection between those two things. Thank you, Professor Andrew. And um, I have to say, I agree with you in terms of um, that we share power with the natural world. I mean, here in Egypt, the River Nile um, is termed as the gift of Egypt. Uh, it's been given as a gift and it is taken into consideration in terms of the politics, the economy. So you were absolutely right. I mean, yes, the non-human has become an essential part of our life and it is taken into um, the political um, you know, agenda of a nation in terms of its also its identity as well. Um, so I do agree with you in terms of that. Um, now, Professor Andrew, um, I'm just going to check if we have any more questions. Do we have any more questions? Uh, oh, Nora saying I'm not a professor yet, but thank I you. <laughs> okay, Nora, take this as Soon a good that's gonna It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Okay, um, <laughs> Professor Andrew, now for some of our um, attendees who, uh, you know, joined in a bit late, um, can you kindly introduce yourself fully and about your work and your publications and your research interests? Um, because they might have missed that at, at the beginning. We would appreciate it. Most of my work has been in the area of uh, Irish poetry, um, some work in, uh, in uh, other aspects of Irish culture. Um, I've published uh, Articles on a uh, range of Irish poets from Yvonne Boland to Heaney to um, uh, Paul Muldoon to Paula Meehan. So I uh, published a book that looked at um, Irish, modern Irish poetry in relation to Catholicism and which is my own religious context. The book was published by Syracuse. Uh, it's called A Chastened Communion, Modern Irish Poetry and Catholicism. And what I attempted to do in that work was see how Irish poets took the inherited concepts of Catholicism, concepts that were in many way, ways imposed upon them, and how they transformed them, how they made them into something perhaps um, more flexible, more life affirming, if you will. Um, since then, my last publications have, have dealt with climate crisis, the one I mentioned before. Um, yeah. And I'm uh, on the cusp, this is my perhaps last official act, I'm on the cusp of retirement, so. Thank you, Professor Andrew. I think we have a question from Associate Professor Ahlem Osman, soon to be Professor. I mean, we're, we're hoping everyone's gonna be promoted to Professor soon. Um, you know, I'm working on um, comparative poetics and I'm studying especially what makes poetry poetry. So uh, I'm interested in knowing what's your definition of poetry? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I think the competitive uh, um, poetics is, is marvelous, um, and I'd be very interested in, in your work. I am going to quote um, the 18th century uh, 
uh, British literary um, figure, Samuel Johnson, whose response to that question is, to define poetry is like defining light. Um, it is a very, very difficult thing to, to define. Um, and it, I, I certainly think that um, I'm in favor of more expansive notions of what constitutes poetry. I, when I have taught my students that, I've, I've tried to convey that. Um, one of the, the people that I, I wrote on in the book that I talked about, and maybe Finola knows of him, is uh, a, a guy by the name of Paul Durkin. And he's got very, you, you might even use the word sloppy. I wouldn't necessarily, very open form. Um, the, the, they're quite discursive um, works, but I still regard them as, as poetry. I mean, there is the kind of use of imagery, the kind of condensed uh, capacity of uh, uh, that we associate with poetry, right? Where it is um, compacted, um, all of those things. But I'm going to let you define that. <laughs> That's such a tricky question. And I think it's somebody who can, who can do comparative. I've been reading a lot uh, in this um, um, field and I, I, I feel that it's really hard. It's pretty hard to define what poetry is. Uh, it is. For me, poetry is aimless. It's language for language's sake. Uh, you're not uh, trying to transfer ideas. You're not aiming at teaching people lessons. It can, it can of course, uh, carry a lot of messages and teach people, but it's something transcendental. It, it uh, transfers you to a new realm. Uh, where feelings like dominate uh, over uh, uh, the mind, but it, but again, it's like mind and body. It cannot like form and content, um, and it's it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to define it. Ala Abdul Hadi, the poet that I'm comparing to Isra Pound, he is a, a theorist and he is a, a leading figure in the field of comparative poetics. Uh, he wrote uh, the nuclear genre paradigm, which sure. aims at yeah, uh, unifying um, or aiming at deconstructing the Eurocentric uh, approach to comparative poetics and uh, moving towards a unifying approach to the field of world poetics. So he, he wrote a book on uh, prose poetry and he, he tried to establish uh, uh, certain uh, links between poetry and prose, poetry and play, uh, poetry and meaning. And he came up with this new term, which is called the poetic block or the poetic plot. He has two terms, actually. The poetic block, he means, you know, he, in Nashida, which I'm working on, is a, a work that includes multiple genres. It's not only poetry, prose poetry, it includes makama writing, it includes uh, non-fiction, it includes uh, rhymed poetry in the tradition of classic Arabic poetry, uh, free verse, prose poetry, all different types of poetry, you see, but it's the impact of the whole work, which he means by the poetic block, which gives us this feeling that this is poetry and nothing else. And and he's, he say, he's saying that uh, poetry is the only genre that can like uh, accommodate all the other genres and still uh, uh, preserve its identity as poetry. I asked him that question, what poetry means to you? And he, imagine, <laughs> you can imagine, he himself, he couldn't define it. He, he said, I, uh -huh. I have been, I've been writing poetry since I was two years old and, uh -huh. and I cannot define it. And, and he wrote like, <laughs> He, he, he composed a, a whole series on comparative poetics and, and he wrote a lot of books on poetry and wrote poetry, but, but he cannot really define it. What's, what's the, the uh, um, scholar's name again for me? Uh, uh, Ali Abdel Hadi, he is the uh, president of the Egyptian Writers Union. Okay. And he, right. he is the poet I'm comparing to Israel Khan. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, I think the, the central thing that you mentioned is the use of metaphor. And, and the prevalence of, of metaphor, of figurative language in poetry, which 
by its very nature, opens new perspectives, right? Um, you know, the, the, the great French theorist Paul Ricoeur in his rule of metaphor talked about the fact that poetry, you know, awakens us to new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing, new ways of, of speaking. Um, and it does that, you know, through metaphor more than anything else. So, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you both uh, Professor Andrew and Associate Professor uh, Ahlam Osman. And we've got other um, attendees have actually decided to share in the chat box their definition of poetry. Um, well, we've got Dr. Dalia Hamas says, for me, poetry is a discourse to be analyzed by a clearly well-defined theoretical framework. And then Fanola Colgan says, poetry for me is about personal expression best known and understood by the author. So, and yes, thank you, Nora, for posting the name of the author that Associate Professor Ahlam Osman is working on. His, his name is Ale Abdel Hedi, and the name has been posted in the chat box. That's wonderful. I'll have to look uh, at his work, which I didn't know before. So, um, these are all great questions, I have to say. I've talked in front of a number of different groups. I don't know that I've ever gotten as rigorous and thoughtful. Uh, uh, a set of questions has, has, has been conveyed here this evening, this afternoon for me. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Professor Andrew Oak, thank you very much for accepting the invitation from the Research Center for Irish Studies to uh, give a seminar on your chapter, um, it, you know, in your co-edited um, book, Contemporary Irish Poetry and Climate Crisis. Um, and your chapter is called Reading Shimas Heaney's Bog Poems in the Ampersine. Andrew Pusin, um, thank you very much um, for your time and for the knowledge you've shared this evening with us. We hope to see you in future research events uh, with the Research Center for Irish Studies from the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the British University in Egypt. I, I thank you very much for um, the invitation, Professor Rihanna. And um, I would uh, again echo the fact that uh, I, I really appreciate the thoughtful um, questions. So thank you all. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.